Okay, hey guys, so I told y'all earlier in the week that we were gonna get the new podcast going. Um, I got a good friend of mine on, I went to the IT course with last year. A little bit of a background on him, he's from Tucson, Arizona, joined the Marine Corps in 2006. Uh, after graduating MCRD San Diego, of course, we all say East Coast versus West Coast. We'll give it to him, all right? Pretty cool dude. Uh, graduated MCRD San Diego, went to SY West, became an 0311. After that, he did three deployments with 3-5. He did the OIF, OEF, and he did a MU, which for those of y'all that don't know, it's Iraq, Afghanistan. And when you're on the MU, you're on a ship, and you kind of get tasked out uh, wherever your, your battalion gets uh, sent a mission to. After he did those deployments, um, he actually has a really cool story, which he'll be sharing with us tonight. Um, after that, he went to uh, Weapon Field Training Battalion in uh, Edson Range, that's West Coast, Paris Islands, East Coast, Edson Range is uh, West. After that, he went to 2-7. He did three special purpose mag tasks over there. Um, that's where I actually, 2-7 is where I'm at right now, so we have that relationship as well. Um, yeah, guys, pretty badass guy, and I can't wait to introduce you to him, so here he is. Here we go. All right, Freddie, thank you for coming out, man. Yeah. I told everybody uh, a few weeks ago that you were the, pretty much the entire reason why I did this whole thing, man. Um, hearing your story at the IT course, it made me just realize how many people have like badass stories that nobody ever heard before. And when I heard your story, I was like, damn, like that's freaking awesome. Um, while I was on deployment, I had a bunch of people reach out to me just asking like what the military was like. And I was like, my story isn't shit versus what you have. So, uh, without further ado, man, just pick up the floor and kind of like give us a little background about yourself and go from there. Yeah, so I think you, you first of all, thanks for having me out here. It's, I appreciate you, your first podcast in the States. I've watched your first one. Uh, you know, you said you got a lot of feedback off of it. Um, I think an hour, you know, you got the whole time thing, an hour plus, an hour minus. I think an hour is like perfect. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me out here. It means a lot. Uh, and then to be able to be at your promotion tomorrow morning, another, yeah. another big thing, I think, I've never told you this directly and I know, you know, this is your podcast, but I talk a lot about you, right? Mm -hmm. I've only met you. I only met you a year ago, yeah. you know, it's a little over a year ago at the IT course. Uh, but I tell, I talked to my boys about you and like the way you present yourself the, from the beginning, uh, from when I met you and then getting to know you better and the father, the husband, the Marine, the guy, the friend that you are, uh, I appreciate that, that that you bring that to the table. And I, I do look up to you. People say, don't look up to, you know, people have this this perspective that you have to look up to people that are higher than you. That's mm -hmm. not the case. I have sergeants and corporals, and I tell them this all the time. You know, I look up to you. Why? Because you're you're this great of a person. You you know, you you do right, and you take care of the, the guys. So thanks for having me out here. Yeah, man, it means a lot. Um, like I said, like, it's the door swings both ways and that, yeah. man. Like, when I heard your story, I was just like, dude, like, talk about like going through some shit and like just pushing through it, man. And I think like a lot of people that actually message me, like I got kids that are like in high school and they're like, Hey dude, I want to join the Marine Corps because it's the most elite. And like we all had that mentality. I talked about in the first podcast I right. did and hearing your story, man, like that is that definition, dude. Like you have some shit go on in your life and you didn't like, I talked about like marking time on it, you know, like people like have a fuck up, have something happen in their life. And they just stay sucked in that circle. And yeah. I think, like, your story is perfect, man. Like, you hit it on the head. Like, you had some adversity come your way. And, like, throughout the years, and, like, you just pushed through it. And you're fucking, you're a dude I look up to, like, Absolutely. extremely, man. So, appreciate that. Um, so, guys, here's a, here's a little background. So, at the IT course, the martial arts instructor trainer course, uh, we do a little bit of a tie-in. And at the end of the day, each student is um, assigned to have a little tie-in. Well, Freddie... He had a, a story that he told in the entire class. When he told a story, he made it as if it was somebody else. And it, it had like grown ass men in tears because it was that touching. At the end of the story, when he uh, said that it was him, it, it kind of like moved everybody. That's why um, him telling the story right now, I'll let, you, I'll let you pick it up. Like how like, you, you know, you didn't tell that story for years afterwards. So I'll let you pick it up, man. Yeah, so the uh, when I was with 3-5, we deployed to Sengen, Sengen, Afghanistan. It's one of the bloodiest battles uh, that we've seen since probably Ramadi, Fallujah, back in the early 2000s, uh, right after September 11th. Um, so deployed to Sengen, uh, sergeant squad leader, and uh, just fast forward all the way up to my third deployment out there in Sengen. And December 30th, 2010, I was out on a patrol. 
Um, and about two hours into it, three hours into it, we're on our way back to the patrol base, the PB. And one of my one of my last corp was my assaultment steps on an ID. Um, right outside the patrol base, probably about 150 meters outside of it. He steps on a on a low debt low debt uh, ID, and it doesn't go off all the way. Um, so we cast vacuum to the PB, uh, get him get him to the truck, get him to the uh, next uh, care station, and we realized that the ID didn't go off all the way. And again, when I gave this story, just again. Like, like you said, when I gave this story, I always say it in the third person. Mm -hmm. um, and then I don't, you know, I don't talk about it being me, but um, here, what, once we met back them, we were told that the ID didn't go off all the way. So we went back out there, uh, lo laid some uh, wall charges down on it or some demo on it. And as we were laying it down, um, the Taliban had been watching us and they, uh, they ambushed us from what what these uh, what we called murder holes. So murder holes being uh, these mud hut buildings, mud hut walls with holes on them, just big enough to where they would point their barrels down and uh, just spray and spray uh, to the left and right, and you know there's hope that they hit one of us. Uh, so that was the case. We went out there and placed demo uh, on that IED, and the, the Taliban ambushed us. I remember there was four of us out there. It was me, my assaultman. Uh, my engineer and my APL, my assistant patrol leader. Uh, we went out there, put the ID down, or put the uh, demo on the ID, and the Taliban ambushed us. Um, two of those shots uh, hit me in the thighs. Um, I was the fourth man uh, in the back. I was the last man in the fire team. Uh, the three guys scattered a different direction to the next wall, um, and I was too far back to run that way. Uh, so what I did is I ran towards the fire, uh, putting up my M4 and just spraying uh, those murder holes. Um, didn't really realize that I was I was hit. It was it was really really warm, um, kind of just like getting like an iron burn, like you're taking an iron to the you know to to your skin. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of how it felt. So, uh, and at that point we were in a gunfight, so adrenaline started kicking in, and you know we just we were, we were ready to gun at that point. Um, Ran about 50 meters, um, got to a little ditch with, with about a half a, a waist, uh, waist high wall, uh, jumped in there and that's when I like laid down and realized that uh, my frog camis were, were filled with blood. Um, I was laying there and I had all this gear on me. I had my Kevlar on, I had my camel back uh, and I tried to get up and, and I couldn't. Um, so out of my peripheral vision, I see my team leader, my APL, uh, Corporal Zachary Wallace, running towards me, doing the same thing as, you know, all guns are blazing. Uh, and he comes in and, you know, kind of like the movies, uh, you see him just take a knee and scrape all the way to me, just uh, like skateboard all the way to me in the knee. And he immediately starts working on me, uh, gets my seatbelt cutter off, uh, rips off my camis, uh, the first thing he does is rips off my left side of my cami and I look down and there's blood gushing. Uh, and at that point I was like, all right, this is, this is it. Like my femorals hit. Um, this is how I'm going to go. Nope. That, that, that son of a bitch didn't let me. Uh, he put his entire, uh, two fingers and then his fist right down on it, uh, and stopped the bleeding, put the fist down, pulls the tourniquet off, applies it, cranks it. Um, and I'm telling him to get off of me. It was the most painful thing I have ever gone through. Um, and then the next thing, he works on the right side. Uh, does the same thing. Luckily, no femoral was hit on that side. But, you know, patches me up and uh, starts calling out the next squad. Uh, you know, 150, 200 meters out from the patrol base. The quick reaction force, the QRF, uh, gets called out. Um, they come out, you know, the whole squad is, is out there, all guns blazing on this village. Uh, they just took out their squad leader, so uh, they're gonna do everything in their power to get them out. Um, so that's that's what they did. And and here they are, the, the next QRF squad comes out and puts me on a stretcher um, and starts carrying me out. Um, Wallace, Sack Wallace uh, coordinated the, the counter attack while they picked me up. You know, he said, I got on the radios, he said at one, two, three, everyone's uh, light it up. We're going to move him and we're going to carry him out. Uh, so he did that. And 
Yeah, he, he coordinated the attack and the Kazovac got me out of there. Um, I think what gets everyone in that story is as I'm getting carried out, the QRF squad leader, Sergeant Aaron Beckett, one of my good buddies, uh, comes out and he's on one of the corners carrying the litter. Uh, and I reach up and I'm looking at him and I'm just getting carried out. And I reach out and in my mind, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm fading away at this point. And I reach up to him and I say, you know, I reach out and I grab his hand and I said, tell my mom I love her and tell my boys I said I'm sorry. And I repeated it twice. I said, tell my mom I love her and tell my boys I said I'm sorry. Because at that point, I thought I was, you know, I thought I was gone. And he pretty much told me like, dude, we're getting you the fuck out of here. Shut the fuck up. And at that point, it kind of just faded away. I remember them putting me in the truck. I remember the whole thing, um, you know, getting put in the, uh, in the uh, M ramp and getting, you know, the 15 minute ride to, to where the helo landed. I remember getting to where the helo is and I remembered everything like it was yesterday. Yeah. Um, you know, I got on, on, on the bird, the Air Force picked me out, the PJs. Uh, their call sign is Pedro. Um, or Pedro, and um, they give they give everyone a coin. Uh, the way I remember that one, if you've seen uh, Lone Survivor when Marcus Cottrell gets put on the bird, that's how I remember it. Just being you know centered on that bird, and them start working on me, taking everything off, uh, injecting me with morphine. Um, and the last thing I remember being on that flight is one of the PJs took my hand, put a coin down on, and closed it. And put it to my heart um, and I looked down and before he closed my hand I looked down and it was one of the PJ coins uh, that says saved by Pedro Damn, it's uh, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a pretty badass coin put it to my heart um, and you know the next thing it's all recovery after that mm -hmm. point now I'm just gonna like stop right there so I remember in the course you were saying that when you made it back to the States everybody pretty much was like becoming like naysayers like hey man listen you're not gonna be able to walk again or you're not gonna stay in the marine corps and in your head you're like fuck no like i am like fuck whatever you're saying i am gonna be able to walk again i'm gonna be able to run i'm gonna be full duty and didn't you say something about like you made it a goal of yours to run like a 300 pft or 300 cft before your boys got back yeah that was definitely one of the goals um that's something i wanted to achieve i wanted there was a lot of naysayers there was a lot of negativity that came from uh, the doctor personnel, uh, everywhere I went to on recovery, they said it's going to be a 12 to 18 month work or a 12 to 18 month recovery. Um, you might, you know, it was from that to you might lose your left leg. We might have to amputate it, um, which will put you on a medical board in retirement. Um, and, and, you know, they try to turn it positive. They said, you know, you're going to be making X amount of thousand dollars a month for the rest of your life. Uh, you're going to be taken care of. Sure, you're going to have a prosthetic, but we're gonna take care of you. Uh, I wasn't done with the Marine Corps. Um, I had just re-enlisted. Uh, my boys were still in Afghanistan. This was December 30th, so literally the halfway point of mm -hmm. a seven month deployment uh, is when I went down. So yeah, they told me that I was, if I recovered, it was a 12 to 18 month um, and you know possibly lose my leg. So at that point, I took that as a challenge. Um, I took that as a challenge to, to you know, completely destroy that. And it was a challenge, my challenge to run another 300 uh, PFT CFT, but also um, to take my boys on a death run, you know, the, the, when they, off the bird, when they got right? off the bird. <laughs> yeah, when they got off the plane and, you know, I, I did it. Um, that's, that was my goal and I, I met it and it was four and a half months. Uh, that was December 30th and April 14th or 13th. That's when they got back. They got on the 96 and then came back and, uh, we went on the little death run up uh, first on Hill. All right, so for like the, because there, there are a lot of uh, civilians that do watch the video and the comment. So when they hear PFT, CFT, they have no idea what it is. So uh, if you kind of want to talk about like, hey, like what, what is your PFT? What is your CFT? And like, what do, yeah, you, what do so you shoot for? I can't, I can't remember. We were definitely in PFT season. I can't remember if the CFT was even around in 2010 yet. But regardless, I know I came back, the PFT, the physical fitness test, um, now it's a little bit harder back then it was 20 20 pull-ups uh 115 crunches in two minutes and the the run the run time it still hasn't changed it's still 18 minutes uh 
for three miles. Anything under 18 minutes, it's a perfect score. Um, so that was the goal uh, to run three miles in under 18 minutes, get the 20 pull-ups and do the 115 crunches. Um, you know, I, I had to learn how to walk again. Yeah. Um, I was in a you know wheelchair, crutches, uh, a walker, and then you know at, at that point I just picked it up and, and ran with it. Literally ran with it. Um, they would tell me come to come to physical therapy twice a week, and you know we'll eventually get there. In my mind, I, how am I going to recover mm -hmm. with going to therapy twice a week? So I asked my therapist if I can come in during the week when they weren't busy. At this point. Uh, 2010 to, or 2011, it was it was it was pretty busy down the week. You know, the battalion took a lot of casualties. Afghan Afghanistan was hot at the time, um, so I went in there every day. Plus, I did my own workouts. I did the pool a lot. Um, you know, so I, I picked it up and I ran with it, and I made sure that by the time they got back, I was mm -hmm. I was able to run. Yeah. So, like, one thing I want to talk about is like how you were saying they were like, "Hey, you know, we're gonna help you out. You'll be able to medically retire." Um, a lot of people look at that as an opportunity to get paid without doing shit. Right. But um, when we talk about, like, my first podcast I did, guys were saying, hey, why did you join? Um, as, like, cliche as it might sound, like, people don't say, hey, I'm joining the Marine Corps to become a millionaire. Like, you don't ever hear it because, quite frankly, in the military, we don't get paid shit. No. So um, when some people will hear that mentality, hey, man, you could have gotten medically separated and got paid – uh, like, I think that's like a prime example right there of like, hey, we don't do this shit for the money. Like, in your mentality, you're like, no, like, I'm not done. Like, how old are you when that happened? I was 22, 23. Yeah, so 22, 23 years old. Like, I mean, you're like still early in like, your Marine Corps career. You have so much ahead of you. Um, and like, at that point, like, you're like, yeah, I'm not done. Like, it's like right now, like, I, I'm telling myself, like, with the shoulder, you know, the past four years, I've been doing college. I like I told everybody I in that video, I took the ASVAB four times in order right. to score. And I'm at a point right now where I'm, like, nervous if the Marine Corps says, hey, like, your shoulder's too messed up. Sorry, like, we can't keep you. Like, I had the same mentality. Like, I'm 27. Like, I feel like I still have so much more in the fuel tank that I want to give back to Marine Corps. And I want to do, you know, I want to become an officer. And uh, one day, where the captain bar is my buddy who passed away. Yeah. So I think uh, what you were saying, like, how, like, you uh, you weren't looking at it as like, hey, I'm an early retirement at 22 years old. Like, right. You're like, no, like I still got my boys over in Afghanistan. Like I'm not done yet. So, um, I think uh, a lot of people that were like messaging me, they were talking about like some problems they were having in high school, um, like family, like being like naysayers about them joining. If you were to give them any advice as far as like they're going through like some trouble right now, like you know, like some kids in high school, like Sergeant P, like he said, like he dropped out of high school. He had to do his GED, he had a study, and he went from dropping out of high school to he like finished top of his class in college. So if you had to give any advice to like guys out there right now that they feel like they're going through some shit, like what would you? Yeah, so with that, um, so I kind of have my own little story story with that. Um, I was supposed to join the Marine Corps uh, June 2005. Um, I was supposed to graduate May 2000, 2005. Well, I got into a little bit of trouble at school. Uh, three days before graduation, before I was about to walk, uh, three weeks before I was about to, to ship out to boot camp, I got expelled. Um, and they didn't let me earn the credits that I had the entire semester. So what is it? I had to go back another semester. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my mom didn't want me to join. Um, I, I went through it. I, I was, you know, I don't come from like a wealthy family. I can, you know, I come from a middle income family. Uh, parents are from Mexico. Um, and they didn't want me to join the Marine Corps. Uh, so it's all about how, how bad do you want it? Like I knew in my heart, um, I wanted to be a Marine. I, I knew it from, you know, I, I think eight, nine, ten years old. I knew I wanted to join the Marine Corps or join the military. Uh, and I didn't let anything stop me. Yeah, it was a, it was a major roadblock that I had to go back another semester. I was not eligible for sports, um, because I was on my fifth year. I was a super senior and I knew I wanted to be a Marine. So my recruiter was pissed. And even after I graduated, he didn't let me leave January. He made me wait all the way until March, uh, which, you know, I'm still thankful for whatever I still got to join. Um, but it, it all comes down to how bad do you want to be a Marine? Like I wanted to, I wanted to be on my feet up and running, you know, in four and a half months. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what I wanted. When you set a goal, when you set something in your mind, it's just how bad do you want it? Are you going to wake up early? Are you going to stay late? Are you going to work through like lunch? Well, you know, whatever it is. So I'm comparing that to my situation, but 
for an, a 17, 18 year old, if, if you have four years to dedicate to serving your country and you know that's what you want to do, it doesn't matter what challenges come your way. You know, even if you've had a criminal record or whatever the case is, like there's ways around that to a certain extent. Um, so just if you want it that bad, you're, you're going to go out there and get it. Yeah. Now, um, another thing I want to talk about uh, is like you knew that your boys were still over in Afghanistan. Obviously, you're thinking about them. They're thinking about you. Um, like what was like in your head that you were like, hey, like I want to do this for my guys come back. Like, did you like think about like, hey, I want to like get back to full duty, keep my, my boys in good spirits? Because, you know, if you guys came back and they diss you in a wheelchair. Um, it's just like, was that like, were you thinking about that? or like Absolutely. So I was laying there in the hospital bed and when my mom came down, she brought my laptop. Um, she brought my, you know, all my electronics. So I had my laptop app up and the speakers full blast the entire day, just hoping that the guys would send me a message. We didn't have Wi-Fi, We didn't have internet out there. Uh, the only time we would have connectivity is when we would go back to the FOB, the forward operating base, uh, operational base, um, you know, once every four or five weeks. So that's when I would hear from them. Uh, so I wasn't going to let that opportunity pass. I put my laptop up and I, I would wait to hear from them. That deployment, we lost 25 guys, 25 uh, Marines from the battalion were killed. Uh, we were up to almost 280 casualties, so wounded in action. And, and that was from gunshot wounds, shrapnel, missing legs, double, single, triple amputees. Um, so in my, in my mind, I was trying to get back out there. I was trying to be a combat replacement. And the cutoff date was approximately the first week of March. Um, I was healed up and, and closed up and patched up. No more surgeries. Uh, up and walking by the first week of March. So I was trying to get on that on that combat replacement um, and it, it didn't happen, I didn't make it through, but that was my goal. My, my main goal was to get back out there with the guys. Because as a squad leader, you, you're the one leading from the front, you're, you know, everything, send the example, all these leadership traits, principles, you're out there for your guys. Like, what is that mentality when your squad leader goes down when, you know, it, it's not good. I was trying to get out there for, for them. You know, what rank did you say you were? I was a sergeant at the time. So sergeant, like, me and you were talking about earlier on, you know, like when I was going through ITX and I had that stress fracture in my foot, like, yeah. you know, like when you become a, a squad leader and like, let's just say the other MOSs that aren't infantry, like the, the sergeants that are out there, um, I think like that's one great point to bring up is like when you do become a sergeant and you start moving through ranks, like it's no longer about you anymore, you right. know, like um, at least that's what I was thinking about my foot, you know, I was just like, dude, like, yeah, my foot hurts. Like I was limping running up and down the ranges, like. You ask any of the boys in my squad or my platoon, like, yeah, like I remember Sergeant Thomas running up and down range 400, like limping all over the place. But at that point, like you were just saying, like that shit's no longer about you anymore. Right. Like it's about your guys. And I think um, like that'll be like a good kind of like transition to uh, like some of the questions that I posted up on Instagram, right. asking for some of my guys. Um, one of the guys was asking like, hey, um, about to get promoted to corporal. I'm a little nervous. What advice do you have for me? So. Um, I'll let you like kind of like, have your l little say on it for like if you were to go back and you were Lance Corporal selected for Corporal, what would you go back and change and what would you like do to better prepare yourself for being a NCO? Uh, so I, I say this all the time to to the guys or to any of the Marines. Um, hopefully you were set up for success as a Lance Corporal because another, one thing the Marine Corps does really bad and, and I think a lot of people can agree to this they put you in a position, they put you in a rank, and then they expect you to be really good at that position and really good at that rank. Instead of teaching you prior to how to be that rank, how to do that job, they put you in it and you, you're not super successful at it because they never trained you to it. So as a Lance Corporal, you, you should already be doing everything a Corporal does. You should already have the initiative. You should already be getting pulled back. You, you It's easier, it's so much easier to pull back you know, the chains on somebody than to try to push somebody. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you're that little bulldog, not not like in a blasting way, not in a yelling way, in like a taking care of the guys and, and taking the initiative, stepping up, doing the right thing. That's to me like that's that's the, the perfect corporal. When me as a platoon sergeant or whatever whatever build I'm in and I'm looking at a corporal, I shouldn't have to tell you to go do something. It's like common sense. You know what has to get done throughout the day. You know the things that must happen. Uh and you shouldn't wait for me to tell you to do it just mm -hmm. just take the initiative and do it um yeah dude like um 
it actually reminds me, uh, we were talking about Gunny Martinez earlier on tonight. Um, at the last month we were sitting in Kuwait, they ran a T-Sulk, which is a team leaders course, you know what that is. Um, and that's like one of the points that he was talking about in his class he was teaching was, you should be coaching, mentoring, teaching the junior guys under you to, to play, to take your, your spot, right? And when they take your spot, you're going to be better than you. Like, if, you have, if you're a corporal and you have a Lance Corporal under you, you're trying to school that kid up, you're trying to like teach him to be the most badass corporal. So when you go on, get promoted sergeant or you PCS and you leave, and that kid is not filling your spot, you should be having him set up for success. So I think that's like a good point we kind of like talk about is when you are that Lance Corporal, and let's just say you don't have that perfect corporal that's ahead of you, because I think we both can agree is that there are lazy NCOs out there. Absolutely. You have those dudes who are, they have the mentality, hey, I'm EASing within a year. They drop the pack and like, they don't think that they have these junior Marines looking up to them, and they do. Like these Lance Corporals, like these junior Marines are like, hungry like everything you're doing they're watching and i think that's a, a good point is that when you are a corporal you should be schooling that kid up to be the most badass corporal um we had a kid his name was uh lance corporal mckenzie in one two he was a junior marine uh it was during my second workup with one two i didn't make that deployment because i wound up pcs in paris island but i got to do an entire workup with these junior marines and this kid you know like when you see uh like you see a spark in some kid, right? Right. And you want to do everything you can to kind of get this kid schooled up. I remember seeing him. I was like, that kid, he's going to be a badass corporal. And I had just got promoted to sergeant. And I was like looking at this kid. I was just like, hey, you know, when I PCS go on the Paris Island, I want this kid to be a, a team leader. I want to be like shit hot. And like as a newly promoted sergeant, I was like trying to do everything I could to get this kid schooled up. So when I would leave, I knew this kid was set up. And here the kid wound up getting meritoriously promoted to corporal on deployment. Um, he got promoted to sergeant like shortly after that. Like the kid was like set up for success, and it's not like a tooting my own horn thing. It's just like uh, preaching what you uh, what's what's the saying for it? Like preach what you or I, I, I can't remember. What is it? Practice what you preach. Practice what yeah, that's what we have Tori in the background for. She's like watching us. She's being our advisor here. Practice what you preach. Um, like he's like a perfect example of it. Like it's like I said, it's not me trying like toot my own horn. It's like me just like doing like the practice what you preach. Like I tried doing everything I could to set the kid up, and he was and. Now, not only did I set him up, it's like now he knew what the right example was. It's like when he has junior Marines under him, he now knows like, hey, like this is what newly promoted Sergeant Thomas did. And like, this is what I can do. That, yeah, that's right. And I'll, I'll add into that. Um, d just, I'm going to give broad, a little bit more broad uh, advice, but also, you know, you can take it and run with it. So the three things I say all the time is be physically fit, be good at your job and be a good person. Like those three things will take you really far. Well, yeah, you can get in the weeds of every one of those, but if you're if you're physically fit, what does that mean? You, if it comes down to it, like Corporal Zach Wallace saved my life because he was physically fit. If you're good at your job, you know what you're doing, and you're able to coordinate attacks and medevacs, and you know what it doesn't matter. Fill in the blank MOS. You can you can be good at your job and and save people's life. And being a good person, being a good dude, being a good Marine, a good father, husband, friend, whatever, mm -hmm. um, it's going to get you far. People are going to trust you. They're going to have loyalty in you. They're going to be loyal to you. Um, so those are like the three specific things, I guess, now that now that you talk about it. And then when it comes down to it, have high expectations. Um, you know, anybody that's that's listening that knows me, especially over the last two years, my, my go-to tie-in is the standard versus the expectation. Uh Everyone's okay with the you know bare minimum standard. People are okay with the 235. They're okay with the 305. What does that mean? They're numbers. They're tools. The, in order to get a first class physical fitness test, it's a 235, which people are okay with. In order to shoot expert on the range, it's a 305 out of 350. People are okay with the 305. Mm -hmm. But if you shoot for a 300 PFT, which is the highest score, if you shoot for a 350 on the rifle range, and you translate those tools, because that's all they are, tools, to your life, and you apply that every day, then you're, you're gonna be a badass because you're shooting for the highest expectations possible. You're, you're gonna be a good husband, a good father, a good wife, you know, a good fill in the blank if you shoot for the higher expectations. So as a Lance Corporal, as a PFC, as a Corporal, as a Gunny, that doesn't matter, as a major, uh, shoot for the highest expectations, stop shooting for these bullshit standards uh, that are out there. Yeah, and I think like, Another great point is like, 
is enforcing that. You know, like you have so many guys now that they're they're afraid to enforce, hey, stop being bare minimum. Because like, dude, I, to be completely honest, I'm not a dude that's gonna rock a screaming eagle high and tight. Like whatever, you wanna have your hair how you have it, great. Like dude, we were like, last month of deployment, I saw this kid and his hair was just stupidly long. I'm like, dude, it was just nuts, right? And I tell him, I'm like, hey dog, like your hair looks like shit right now. And he goes, well, it's three inches. And I was like, yeah, well, guess what? Doing three pull-ups on the PFT is bare minimum. Like, does that mean it's okay yeah. to do three, like, you know, have your three inches of hair on top? And he's like, yeah, you're right. And it's just like, dude, like, the thing is, is like me, me saying that to that kid, if he looked at me any differently, like, hey, man, screw you for calling me out on my shit haircut. Like, me, I don't care. But I think a big problem is now that there are a lot of corporals, there's a lot of newly promoted sergeants, they, they are afraid. Like, they're afraid to say, hey, man, you look dicked up right now because they're afraid of, like, what they're going to think of them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and that's another thing, too. And and I say shoot for these high expectations. I don't I don't always meet them. I don't, but I bust my ass every day. Mm-hmm. I had to learn how to walk again, but I'm still running 300 PFTs. That doesn't mean a whole lot, because, but I, it does to me because I translate that to the way I work every day and the way, you know, I'm approachable around my, my Marines every single day. So people, you know, we talked about this earlier. Oh, you're gifted. Oh, you're genetics. Oh, this and that. No, like I've had 15 surgeries. I had to learn how to walk again. There's a difference between you and I. I wake up early and I get it every single day and I stay late and I get it every single day to, to shoot for that 300. So people just make excuses because they can't, one, can't make it there or two, um, they're, they're afraid to make the corrections or make the calls, just mm-hmm. like you said. Yeah, dude, like, like, I think that is, like, the biggest deficiency that we have right now, man. It's just, like, guys are just so worried about what they look like, man. Like, they're afraid that someone's going to say, hey, man, like, screw that guy because he doesn't want to call me out for, like, dude, like the low boot blasting, for example. Like, it's, like, a grunt thing, you know? Like, dude, right. go out to the field. You want to have low boot blasting because, like, you know, like, you're in Lejeune, like, that's a, that's a must when you're in the field because you get the chiggers and all that shit. Like, worst experience of your life. You know, like, I got it. The cuff sleeves, like, dudes want to look like, yeah, they don't look high speed. Um, but, there, you know, there's a 100% like a time and place for that, you know. Like, when you're back in the rear here, like, on main side, and, like, dudes are rocking out looking like that, and then when you are that guy, like, saying, hey, man, like, you look dipped up right now, people are afraid to do that shit because it's it's, it's 100 like guys like right now like they everybody just wants to be boys um we all heard it before like you know like especially at, at boot camp like i remember like hearing dude say like oh i didn't come here to make friends there's like some truth to it and then like, there's a little bit of like hey dude like just be a good guy you know like if i'm gonna make a correction with you it, it goes two ways either a you're gonna fix your deficiency right and like just respect i'm like trying to enforce it like, especially if like, you're like, you know, me and you were friends. You know, I'd be more of the buddy fucker from like saying like, hey, screw you. Right. I'm going to be shit bag. Because like when you do have these guys that are like peer to peer, like he's a corporal, you're a lance corporal. And then now you're a lance corporal showing up late. And like now me being the corporal, I got to yell at you. Dude, you're fucking late. What the hell? It's like not me like for being a bad dude. It's like it should be you. Like you're supposed to be my boy. You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. And and I say that all the time. Um, you know, I have a broken record. I say this all the time. And and anybody that knows me that's worked with me in the last two years, I, I have to come in and be the bad guy. I have to be the one that makes the corrections because I have a, a sergeant, a corporal sitting there, saw it, and I walk in and they're not making the correction. So I have to be the bad person. That's why staff and SEALs are, you know, the the, the devils, the evil, uh, because we're the ones blasting people. Mm. Um, and I'm not like a confrontational person. I'd, I'd, I'd rather not. If I need to correct somebody, I'm going to pull them aside and be like, dude, you're like, jacked up what are you doing right yeah. instead you know behind closed doors instead of embarrassing somebody and it's not me like you know babying somebody it's like no that's that's just not the right way to do it um so that it, yeah that's that yeah and like that's, that's 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 like my biggest thing i always look at man it's like is it me being a dick or is it you being an asshole for like just not doing the basic right. shit you're supposed to be doing um i had a problem with that when i, when I was in one two like i told you guys i, I was a, a corporal coming from the security forces which, like, that's a whole nother conversation I could have later. Like, I had some people message me, hey, man, I'm coming from security forces, like, going to the police corporal. Um, I told you about my buddy, Sergeant Han, and he's like, dude, just have a backbone, right? When I went to one, two, I remember, never forget, we did a UDP to Japan, and I went down, I told my squad, I was like, hey, we're going to go down to the gym, and we're going to do squat PT. It's just working out in the gym, do your own thing. I was out front, like, I forget the time. I said, hey, be out front zero six. 
615 dudes come rolling up and I start yelling at them all right I'm like what the hell like getting all on them and my one boy was like he apologized after he's like dude listen man like my bad we had like we made you have to yell at us he's like we showed up late like that was my bad like right like when you like look at it that way like it's not it makes you feel a little better like all right like I'm sorry like that I had to freaking yell at you guys but you, you guys kind of did it um Dude, so what we'll do now, uh, like I said, some of the guys um, on Instagram, I put on there, like, just, like, for some discussion points, uh, people were, like, asking some advice to give. Um, I already talked about the one, like, he's getting promoted to the corporal. Um, a mom was talking about here, like, up in the air, like, what their kids want to do. I think we talked about, like, really briefly, like, you know, like, that, that you're in high school or you're in your first years of college, like, I think if you have any time in your life where you don't know what you want to do, I think like that's like perfect, you know, like it's a trial and error thing. Like I joined the Marine Corps. I was trying to do it like the year I graduated, but I wound up like hurt my foot. I had to wait a whole year. Um, but I think like that time in your life is like when you should be up in the air, you know, right? Like when you're like in your late teens, early twenties, opposed to like early thirties, you know what I'm saying? Like, so if you had to give advice to like the mom that's out there, right? Like the yeah, mom so. like saying, what, Hey, my kids are up in the air. Like, so I said that earlier, my mom was completely against it. Um, you know, up until the day I left, our, you know, I'm from Tucson, Arizona. We had to drive two hours uh, to Phoenix to get dropped off uh, at the station at the airport so I can fly to San Diego. Uh, up until the day I left, she was completely against it. And then, you know, she, she you know, cause I'm a mama's boy, 18 years at home, never left the house. You know, Hispanics are super close with their families. Um, so we, we, you know, we hugged, we cried, and I got on that plane. I graduated recruit training. She was there for that. And she has been proud of everything I've done to the point, you know, she has a, a, a wall of, of, you know, my boot camp picture. She took my uh, desert and my woodland cover. She has them hang them up. Everything I, I send her, she hangs it up. Mm -hmm. she, she is completely proud. She's... Uh, She's put everything up, and like I said, I don't come from a, a like a, the greatest of a family, um, so she was glad that I would, you know, I got out of the the streets and I didn't become what uh, my family, you know, older brothers are, um, or older brothers. So she's uh, she's very proud. She's uh, she's proud of what I've done. Yeah. So like, long short, like just be proud. Like you know, your yeah. mom. Like you know, if your kid says, "Hey, I want to join the military," like be proud of your kid. Like, yeah. Your kid wants to go off to college and do whatever. It's like just. Kind of let, let them do their own thing. Like me and my, uh, my aunt Shannon were talking the other day and it's like, you have to like have that point where like, you're starting to guide your kid where to go, but then you have to get to that point where like, Hey, you gotta let them like kind of run free, like figure it out on their own. Like right. what they want to do. I think like the biggest thing, like people like have their kids join the military and they like the mom just instantly just like get into black. Oh, like, yeah. oh no, my kids can go off the war. He's going right. to die. Um, like one thing like my mom says like my brother does instruction you know like you could fall off a ladder and get killed you know that you shit you can drive to work and get hit and do what you know like if you have that mentality like my kid's gonna do something with his life and he's gonna die you can literally look at that at so many jobs you know like shit like everyday life you can die so it's just like if you're gonna like have that thing it's like support your kid's decision like hey he wants to join the military okay cool the military like i could say like i don't think out of all the guys I met that could say the military did them wrong, put them in a bad spot, you know, right. it made them worse. I think, like, the military, like, shit, going to boot camp, I remember, like, waking up, like, 4.30, 5 o'clock every single morning. That shit suck. But it gets the kid that never left the nest. It puts him into, like, a routine. He has a job. He has discipline. And I'm like, shit, you do four years, you do your time honorably and get out. And it's like, I can honestly say, I think a lot of people that do that, they have more good from it than bad. So, um... Yeah, I'd have to agree, man. It's like, you know, if you're a mom out there, your kid wants to join, like, just be proud of them. Yeah, and I was I was just going to add to that. It's not, my mom didn't raise me, you know, bad. I, I was raised with good morals and good values. Uh, coming into the Marine Corps, I just picked up from that and ran with it. Because the Marine Corps does teach you, the military does teach you discipline. And again, I wasn't undisciplined. You know, I'm sure I got in trouble, uh, you know, a little here and there, nothing major. Uh, my mom raised me the right way still to this day if I go home and I don't listen to my mom She still beats me. So uh, <laughs> I'm still disciplined. Um, I, I don't do anything. She doesn't you know, she I don't go against her She'll still yeah. beat me um, So just coming in the Marine Corps, you know, I learned other values and other morals um, And built off that work ethic that I already mm -hmm. had you know, I've been working since I was 14 years old 14 and a half 
Um, and I just picked it up from there and, and, and ran with it. So just think of, of that perspective too. Your, your son, daughter, he or she is gonna learn, uh, you know, just to talk about 4.30 in the morning, five in the morning, getting up, taking care of yourself, you know, cleaning a room, whatever the case is going out to the field, taking care of other people. You, yeah. You're gonna move up in the ranks and you're gonna be expected to take care, care of other people. So are you gonna do that in the civilian world? Not to the extent that, that mm -hmm. you're gonna do it in the Marine Corps, so. Yeah, dude, and that's like, it's not a good thing. It's just like, a lot of people that like uh, have reached out to me, like some kids are like, hey, I'm thinking about joining the army. And they like, they see like Marines, obviously we have a big head, right? It's just like, it's like a branch on branch type thing. Like we kind of like make fun of our branches, but at the end of the day, whether like somebody, hey, they want to join the army, Coast Guard, Air Force, Nas what, National Guard, whatever it is, is like, at the end of the day, man, like, I feel like if you are that person and you're like thinking about joining it, like you're trying to find a bigger purpose for yourself, right. you know? That's it. Um, and it's not anything like, so I, I do have like a lot of my friends like from back home that didn't join the military and I'm not putting them down whatsoever. Cause like I got a lot of my friends that went on to do like great things, you know, like graduate top of the class for college and like making great money back home. Um, so like, I don't want people to ever get the idea like, Hey, he's bashing civilians. It's like, it should be military or that's no. it. It's just like, um, cause like realistically it's like, man, it's like whatever you want to do, whether you graduate high school, college, and you do whatever you want to do with your life. Like without the military, it's fine. Um, but like the point that's really, really wanted to highlight was like the kids that are like, Hey dude, I'm really on the fence. I want to join the military. My family doesn't support it, which I think like me and you both hit that perfectly. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, yeah, man, just having that bigger purpose for yourself Definitely. rather than, uh, doing the typical accessible. I said, I was like, dude, like people are like, Hey, why'd you join? It's like, realistically, I wasn't ready for college because if I had gone to college then, dude, I would have been like dropped out or something. And we talk about the path of least resistance, you know, like right. I wanted to do that. I didn't want to do what everyone else was doing, going to community college or going on college. I was like, dude, I'm do military, I'm going to go test it out. And I got a beautiful wife and two little girls and I have experiences and friends that like, you know, I'm extremely glad that I did, you know, I wouldn't want to take any of it back. Definitely. Um, Another question that people were talking about earlier on, we I mean you kind of broadly talked about it, was cell phone service during oh, the deployment. Okay. So uh, for the person that asks us that question, here you go. Um, experiences may vary, you know, like what was your first deployment, what year? Yeah, 2007 was my first. So 2007, and then um, my first deployment, if you want to call it deployment, you know they have the memes of like Trump looking up into the, the lunar eclipse and like they show it, it's just like, a UDP in Japan is not a real deployment. Yeah. Like, so I, I did that uh, with one, two a few years ago, and I just did this deployment to Iraq with two seven. Um, experiences are gonna vary a hundred percent. Like, you know, like we had the Wi-Fi pucks. Yeah. Like I had internet damn near everywhere I went. Uh, some people had T-Mobile. Like they gave like free internet, you know, free uh, international service. Yeah. So me, I had internet everywhere I went. Now, you, on the other hand, like, you got to tell your part because that's pretty funny to hear. Yeah, so pretty ele ships. electronics, phones, games, you know, all this, uh, we're tied to it every single day. And I, 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 I am, too. I'm, I'm responsible. I'm, a, I'm guilty of it. You know, with work, uh, I have to be tied to my phone. That's, that's, that's I work off my phone. Um, and I hate it. But uh, my first deployment in Fallujah, Iraq, the, uh, the wash up, the clean up, nothing, nothing serious, but went out there and we didn't have, uh, you know, the, the phones we have now. I think I had like a little Nokia at the time. Um, we used to play snake on it, but, uh, and we also had satellite phones out there, sat phones, but we had one for the company. Um, one for the company that's 150 Marines and the company is spread out throughout, you know, uh, half of the city by platoons, so they're gonna rotate it out. You know, one, two weeks, that platoon has it, two weeks later, that platoon has it. Four or five platoons in a company, you're not gonna see that phone, you know, for two, three months, and that was the case. I saw the sat phone every two months, so I got to call home um, like three or four times during my first deployment. Damn. Yeah, and it was, it was lagged, so you get on a satellite phone and you talk, and about five, seven seconds later, they're hearing, um, what, you're they're, they're hearing what you're saying. So, yeah, it's, it's people are stepping on each other. It's it, it's terrible. Those of you that know what a satellite phone is, a sat phone, you you understand the frustration with it. Yeah. So like differences of years ago, back thirty years ago, yeah. <laughs> versus what they have now. Like um, I had some 
uh, it's like a military wife. She said her, her husband's about to go on his first deployment. And she's like, hey, what was it like over there as far as like cell phone service? I was like, man, it's, it's 2020, you know, like everyone over there, like shit, even like the Iraqis that we we're like visiting on post, they're like playing PUBG from their phone, you know, yeah. like it's, it's 2020. It's definitely a different time. Um, it just, just to think it makes you become more appreciative, like from what you had, like a sad phone, like talking like once every couple months. Yeah. And I think it's another thing that like moms think about, right? Cause like, I know my mom did. She was, oh, I was like, she was so nervous on how often she was going to think. Cause when you watch like any war movies, like, uh, with a jarhead or like some yeah. shit like that, like, I think moms think those old movies are what it is today. But it's just like, I realistically, I was like trying to reach out to my mom almost on the, on the daily. Like some people like think it's a little excessive, whatever. I don't, you said you're a mom's boy. Mom's boy. Right? I, I think all grown men, if they like really be honest, right? They're all mom's boys, whatever. Tori's in the background shaking her head. Um, but yeah, I reached out to my mom every day. Let her know I was all right. It was going a couple of days where I didn't hit her up, whatever. We were a little bit more busy. I wouldn't reach out to her. Um, but I definitely think like moms think like they watch these old war movies and they think their kids going off to Nam and they're not yeah, there for yeah. Nowadays it's up until the last deployment that I had, which was uh, 2017. It was the last time I deployed, and you know we have the little pucks. I don't know what it stands for, but the little Wi-Fi mm. uh, capable in our pockets, and everywhere we go, we you know we're able to get on the phone. I would say a majority of the deployed forces nowadays have the capability of, of yeah. jumping on Wi-Fi or not you know a month two month three month wait to, yeah. to communicate i think the worst thing now is like if you're on ship i think dudes on yeah. ship like they have to email or something like yeah. that so i was just thinking about that the, the only time you're not going to have that capability is when when you go on a mew um, yeah. and, so if you guys watch and they're like bitch i was on ship yeah. i had an email like, yeah. you know, all right man we'll, we'll touch base on that um the other thing i'll talk about like somebody asked like hey how did the coronavirus affect us on employment which I'll kind of talk about that and I'll let you kind of talk about like how it affected you back here. Um, so, you know, like what it is around the TQ, like, you know, you just kind of interact with the, the Iraqis, the ISF, Iraqi security forces. Um, once the whole coronavirus like met its peak and they're like, Hey, like shit's getting real. They pulled us back from interacting with them. Like before we were just like every day we just go out, we bring one of the Terps with us and just like see how they're doing. Like kind of building that relationship, you know, like, um, and like once this coronavirus like hit that peak, they're like, hey, y'all aren't interacting with them anymore. Like kind of like just bringing a little bit. Um, it was like kind of like a precautionary measure that they, they did. And it was like, yeah, I, I get it because you know, these guys going all over the place. We don't know where the hell they're going. Um, so it affected us that way. But at the end of the day, we still operated the same, you know, like still went on patrol and everything. Uh, we just didn't interact with the ISF personally anymore. And then shit the whole deployment that was like broadcasted all over facebook uh the news like you you look anywhere like they were telling you about deployments um talk about the whole lance corporal underground thing dude no shit and i see i didn't even tell tori about this there was word for a little bit that we were coming home until september like so we deployed at the end of september yeah i heard that and um we were supposed to be coming home end of april that would have put us at like a seven month deployment and then coronavirus, they're like, yep, no one's coming home. Um, Y'all are stuck over there. And like the, the unit that was supposed to be leaving us, like, like think how they were like, cause they had all the shit packed away. Like they were ready to come on out. And they're like, yeah, y'all aren't going anywhere. You have to stay put. Um, and they over at us, like, yeah, y'all aren't going home. So it, like, it kind of sucked um, not knowing when we were going home. Um, I kept telling the guys so much, I was like, listen, man, if I wasn't married, if I didn't have kids, screw it, man, keep me over here for like a couple of years. Like the pay was good. The chow hall was good. I mean, granted I had a busted shoulder. I couldn't work out, but like dudes were able to hit the gym and everything. Um, but like people like ask about like families and, and deployments and shit. It's like, it does suck. You know, you got a wife and kids back home and like, you know, you have dates set. Hey, I'm supposed to be coming home end of April. I'm ready to see you. And it turns into, I don't know. Like that was probably the worst part about it. Um, luckily, um, when the shoulder, like, so I was benching 405, I told you earlier on, like just being retarded. It wasn't even for like a competition or anything. I felt a rip happen in it. Um, so months go by, it's scar tissue on my chest. The MO thinks it's torn two spots. Um, the battalion was like, hey, we're gonna get him home so he can get his quarantine done and get the shoulder taken care of right away. Um, which I'm finally getting that taken care of tomorrow. But granted, if this shoulder wasn't messed up, I, I don't know what main body it would have been on. Like, so I guess it was a blessing in disguise that right. the shoulders messed up. I got, I got to come home first. 
um, wife and kids. It was great seeing them. So other than us not interacting with the Iraqis anymore and getting held up, that's what, how it affected us. And you kind of talk how it affected you guys. Uh, so where I work right now or what I do, something, a collateral duty that I do is, uh, and I, I, I volunteered a lot for this. I put myself out there, but the corporal's course. So uh, the corporal's course, the last couple of seminars, the martial arts instructor courses, uh, that's probably been the best thing I've, I've done in my unit now for the last two years. So as soon as that came about, uh, COVID came, I was just about to graduate. You know, I was on my last week of graduating my fourth corporal's course since I've been there. Um, and we got told that last week, week three, week three of the three weeks, you can't have a graduation, you can't have a mess night, and you're not doing any more PT, just test the guys out, whatever they have to test out and graduate them. So in, in my mind, I run a pretty uh, rigorous uh, corporal's course. They, they, I run it just like a advanced infantry course with the corporal's course POI. Um, so in my mind, everything that I've done to that point, these, these corporals graduating weren't gonna go through the same experience that I had graduated the prior courses. And they knew that too. The, it, it's kind of like a, a, a sense of, of accomplishment at the time right now. If you didn't go through the, this corporal's course, you really aren't a corporal. That's the mentality there. So the guys were expecting to get slayed at the culminating event, which is about 10 hours long. Um, and they took that away from them. We weren't able to have a mess night and you know everybody was bummed out about it. I explained to the guys, um, your corporal's course was really, really different in, in, in many ways. The COVID, COVID hit, uh, I was able to bring uh, Sergeant Major Canley in, Medal of Honor recipient, uh, and talk to the students. I was able to bring in uh, Corporal Josue Barone, a Purple Heart recipient, uh, uh, single amputee. Uh, so what I'm saying is they, they were able to get a different type of corporal's course, but they didn't get the back end of it, Yeah. Um, which was fine. They, they had a lot more during that first two weeks that I, you know, I was able to get throughout the last courses. Uh, so they, they shut us down. We were able to get a graduation in, but it was, it was just the students, the staff and uh, our guest speaker. Yeah. That's, that's shitty, man. Cause they ran a corpus course for the dudes. Um, so y'all know, like we did our time in Iraq and then we left, went to Kuwait and we sat there for like the past like, month and a half. Um, so they ran a corpus course for the guys out there and they also did the uh, T-Sulk. Um, they asked me, they're like, hey man, do you want to be an instructor for a corpus course? And at the time, there, I was, I was already going to be an instructor for a T-Sulk and I had just picked up another college class. So I kind of like waited out. I was like, all right, I'm going to do this, this college class right now. It's like a biology class. It's kind of like shitty, whatever. Um, but then I looked at it like, would I rather influence the Marines that are in my company at the Lance Corporal level or do the corpus course? And I knew that if I was going to do the corpus course, I wanted to be a hundred percent like devoted straight to that. You know, I didn't want to have the T-Sol going on. I didn't want to have college classes. I wanted to give a hundred percent into that. So yeah, it's just weird. Like to look at like two different sides of it. Like you had corpus course running on over there in Kuwait, which, um, it's a lot different from what you were saying, man. I, watch yeah. your videos dude. yes yeah. you run it it's dude that's awesome man. biggest like, slate definitely it, it's like one of those things i was talking about like having like i posted a picture the other day of like bridgeport it was like a, on my time hop from like five years ago or something and i was like it's a great shitty experience and i was yeah. like who can relate and it's like 100 percent. like when dudes were getting thrashed and shit like they hated it at the time but afterwards they're like dude like i absolutely love it i did that shit so yeah um all right, so we'll, just, we'll finish up here in the last couple questions. Uh, someone's asking like where I would want to go for a next duty station. Um, we already know you're going to go be a drill instructor running and screaming oh, yeah. at San Diego, which is badass. Um, I don't know. Uh, Tori, she wants to go to Quantico. Uh, she wants to go back on the, uh, the East Coast, um, which is weird. Cause we were just talking about tonight how like 29 Palms weirdly grows on you. Like, Very. Don't know how or why, but it just does. It's like... It's, its own little place here um but man as far as like a duty station like <sighs> quantico would sound nice but like it's so born and raised new jersey the people up there like it's a, it's a different breed man like yeah. the north right yeah i love it i'll visit every chance i get i was like i normally go home every summer i love visiting jersey but it's not a place i want to move to the traffic is insane taxes are higher you got tolls right 
Small oh, funny yeah. story I'm going to talk about toll. Got stationed down in Georgia. I was going into Jacksonville, and the very first time I crossed over a bridge, I was freaking out because I was driving my truck. I was like, shit, I don't have toll money. Like, I actually like almost pulled off on the side of the road, freaking out, looking for toll money. And then I'm like, all right, whatever. I'm just going to tell the guy I don't have money. I go over to the bridge, and there's no toll. I was like, all right, man, the south is pretty nice. Uh, so, yeah, long story short, man, I, I don't like the north too much. Um, Tori, she said she would want to go to Quantico, so happy wife, happy life, right? Yeah, she shook her head, yes. Uh, but, like, me personally, I love the South, man. Like, being a PMI down on Paris Island, like, that was, like, by far my best, best job I had. But if you had to pick anything other than being a drill instructor, San Diego, where would you go? Let's see, yeah, you, you talked about it, um, and, and we talked about this earlier. Any Anywhere you go, I... I, I kind of think I want to come back to 29 Palms uh and and people ask me all the time what was your you know your better duty station was because I've been with two infantry units three five and two seven so they asked me which was a which one did you like more and I said I've gained and developed and grew at every battalion and every company I had um or I was with and the difference between three five and two seven Pendleton and 29 Palms is when you're in 29 Palms you're stuck Mm -hmm. uh you're you're there so the camaraderie and the cohesion is a lot tighter yeah um if you're gonna go somewhere it's three hours away which is san diego la and vegas uh and you're gonna get with the boys and go but you're not gonna do that every weekend it gets expensive um in san diego it's all there in pendleton it's all there it's, it's, it's a distraction so people get off work and they go to the beach here you get off work you're with the boys uh, yeah. you're stuck at the barracks or you know you're here at 29 palms so I love both duty stations. I don't want to go to North Carolina. I don't want to go anywhere anywhere on the East Coast. Um, so I, I, weirdly enough, I would say 29 Palms would be where I would want to come back. Yeah, man, it's, I hear you, dude. It's just like the other night I was out here drinking. I was just like, dude, it sucks. Because like when I was in Paris Island, I was in a platoon of sergeants. We all like we'd do, we'd work our ass off during the week, you know, pushing platoons, uh, uh, recruits for the range. And like on the weekends, we just let loose. And it's like here, dude, this coronavirus, like I can't even hang out with the boys yeah. right now because they're all stuck at the barracks. But that's exactly what it would be, man. Like, you know, the work week is over. We don't have anywhere to go. Like, like uh, one of my boys, is his birthday today. Um, Valentina came and brought him a cake and shit. But we were just saying, man, like we really, we really wish the shit wasn't going on because you'd be out here drinking. But yeah, I hear you, dude. Like, nowhere to go. Like, yep, let's go hang out with the boys tonight. Um, all right. Last one, uh, how to be a good dude. We kind of talked about it a little bit. Um, it's, I hear about how to be a good dude or a good dudette, right? For the, yeah. for the guys and girls watching. Um, I think at the end of the day, that whole like, how you want to be treated. Um, we're talking about like your monitor or what? No, I was talking to one of my boys, Baron from Paris Island. He was like talking about his monitor. He was like asking him for orders and he was like oh well when i was a sergeant and I, my monitor didn't let me go here he kind of told me to fuck off this is like dude if you know how like shitty that was for you why make that shitty for the next guy so i think like my little point i'll talk about how to be a good dude or good dudette if you had something shitty happen to you in your marine corps career and you have the ability to change it change it you know don't make it shitty for the next person because you had a shit you know what i'm saying yeah um and and i'll start off saying i've been extremely fortunate with my leadership coming into the Marine Corps. I've never had bad leadership, like team leader, squad leader, platoon sergeant, platoon commander. I've been very fortunate up until, you know, I left 2-7, great leadership all around. So I've had leadership that has taken care of me, but I've also seen bad leadership on the outside of, of my good leadership. And I told myself, I never want to be that person. I want to be approachable. I want to be the person that mm -hmm. takes care of of anybody not just marines you know you go out in the civilian sector you're out there in town you're you're we're expected to take care of people um when it comes to that uh just being a good person i say that all the time right super broad statement but we talked about so i'll, I'll relate this to to the marine corps i'll talk about the marine corps we talked about david goggins I'm a, I'm a huge believer on david goggins and one of the things he talks about is in his book uh you can't hurt me is earn he talks about earning his trident every single day. So the way I translate that to us in the Marine Corps is earn your rank, earn your billet every single day. Uh, 
and I tell my, my corporals, my sergeants, my staff sergeants, at the beginning of the day, take off your rank, take it off and put it back on. You just got promoted that day. At the end of the day, you're at 100% because you started at 0% in the morning. So if you have that concept and you have that mindset and that lifestyle, you're going to come into work as you just got promoted that day. Because if you remember the day you got promoted to that billet or that rank, you busted your ass that entire day yeah. or that entire week, that entire month, but somewhere it faded, it phased out. So if you take off your rank, if you promote yourself to that billet every single day, start at zero, work your way to 100, at the end of the day, you empty out that tank at, 100, at a zero, you restart the next morning, then you're going to be a significant leader, a significant person, as opposed to a successful person, because we're all going to be successful. There's people that come in the Marine Corps, they do their four-year enlistment, and they're successful. But there's people that are significant that are going to make impact. Yeah. on, you know, not just to be a better Marine, but also a better father, husband, wife, fill in the blank. So be significant, be instead of being successful. Yeah, that definitely ties in. All right, for my boy Reed, I told you about it. His question he asked me, he's like, how do I shave the butt chin? I simply spread and I have Tori shave it for me. <laughs> just kidding, guys. Yeah, I spread it and I shave it. Um, but yeah, man, we'll, we'll finish it off with that. Um, definitely thanks for coming out, dude. Like, just be uh, getting promoted tomorrow, have you come out and pin is uh, definitely an honor. And to have you share your story, man, because I remember you said, like, it, it took you a while to be able to, like, come out and tell that story. So, yeah. uh, the fact that you came out here and kind of told it on here, like I said, man, you're, like, the reason why I wanted to start this whole thing. So, the fact that you came out here and told that story, man, I definitely appreciate it. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll close it out with this. And, again, thank you for having me. But it, it doesn't nobody nobody cares what i did 10 years ago nobody cares that you know i'm this rank at the end of the day the marines that are be below you or the you know personnel that are below you they care what you can do to do for them what do you bring to the table that day how are you going to take care of me how are we going to build loyalty nobody cares how many deployments i have under my belt you have a purple heart cool story dude like what are you doing for me today mm -hmm. so don't get and i say that because you're you're, you're picking up staff tomorrow don't and I know you won't, but people get promoted and, and they they feel like they made it. They picked yeah. up the rocker. They don't have to be with Marines. They don't have to go PT. They don't have to train anymore. They don't have to fill sandbags. Don't, X, Y, Z, you fill in the blank. Don't ever become that leader. I know you won't, but uh, that's how, you know, that's how you're going to be significant. Dude, yeah, I know this is going to end it, but I'm literally just ending it with like this last comment. So yeah, Star Major Bull on Facebook, you follow him on there. So somebody asked me a question today and they were like, hey, what advice do you have for an NCO or staff NCO that hasn't been on any deployments? And I think you just like hit the nail on the head, man. Yeah. Like who gives a shit? What the yeah, hell have you did in your career, man? What are you doing right now? So I think like to end it off with that, man, it's just like, um, who cares what you have on your chest, man? Because yeah. realistically, when you're working, you're wearing academies, like nothing's there. It's like, you are like exactly like what you're doing today says everything about you. So dude, like the fact that we just finished off with that, dude, I think you uh, hit it on the head. Yeah. Um, all right, guys, that's it. Um, I got some other people in mind for the next couple of podcasts, but, um, thank y'all for watching. Just like I said, comment below, let us know like how you liked it. Feel free. Uh, feel Jesus, man. Tori's going to like shake her head back there. Feel free to, uh, comment anything you want, man. Any feedback is, uh, appreciative. I don't care if it's good, bad, whatever. Adios. Stay oh. motivated.